and he bought me a lottery ticket and he handed it to me and I took it. And I was like, that thought, I was like this, what if I won? Hi, welcome to Royal Path, where we ask the hard questions. You guys, what was the very first movie you saw that you knew was bad? That like orange. nobody had to tell you. Orange, clockwork, orange, clockwork, orange, clockwork, orange, clockwork, orange. <laughs> I, I, can, I can remember it so vividly. I can still feel the visceral reaction. I was like, my sister should not let me watch this. Why am I watching this? From that first scene, of the yeah the the bum in the alleyway just getting mm -hmm. violence it was like uh, this this is wrong i should not be watching this mm -hmm. oh. without a doubt how old were you at the very 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 oldest i might have been 11 oh wow that's uh, yeah, yeah that's too young for that one I, I want to I could I want to say I might have been even younger. Yeah, that's too young for that one, for mm -hmm. sure, for sure. My, right. Mine was this this movie. Um, I think it was called Krull. It was like a oh, boot, yes. bootleg <laughs> Conan or something like he that. He had he had the claw thing that opened up, right? Oh but man, he had, like so... that giant Chinese star <laughs> that like so opened bad. up. I totally remember Krull. You know. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to steal your thunder. <laughs> but there's there was a time when there was this. Crow was this great example of this weird sci-fi fantasy that you because mm -hmm. it because like mm -hmm. sci-fi is laser beams, fantasy is magic and swords, right? So like mm -hmm. Crow was this like hybrid. <laughs> yeah. So bad, so bad. <laughs> what about yours, Andrew? I've never seen Crow. I mean, oh, don't don't watch it. It's really bad. Is it not even worth checking out? Like from like an ironic standpoint. Oh, from an ironic standpoint, it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. I mean, right. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't know if I had a super. I was gonna say, episode one or two of Star Wars, probably one of those ones. But I think I'd be lying. I I really liked those movies when I was a kid and like only growing up later on did I realize oh wait these are these are pretty bad so I can't be but I think actually the movie in the same vein of Clockwork Orange for Father was Starship Troopers for me I remember being like I couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 and I watched it and I remember like being like uh, like spiritually disturbed as like and I kept like trying to talk about it with my friends, but they're all too cool. So yeah. it didn't bother them. So I was like trying to process this and I was like, what are, uh, have you seen it? Yeah. And, and you know, what's crazy about it is that I had, that was actually, I had read the Heinlein book that it's based on. My stepfather had given yeah. it to me when I was a kid and it's it, absolutely incredible. Like I remember reading it yeah. and being like, wow, this was one of the great. And then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh wait, this is, wait, this is the Heinlein book. And I was like, oh, it's, this is so bad. But yeah. aren't they, aren't they purposely trying to be ironic in that movie? Isn't there yeah, like a whole. No, it's, it's not bad. No, it's actually a pretty gosh darn good movie. Like I love that movie now. Okay. okay. But there's people okay. getting chopped in half and like brutally too. They're like. Yeah. So okay. Gotcha. gotcha. I, I remember watching that and being so like, now that I know what it's like to disturb a child <laughs> when you're like when you're little like i've heard like fathers talk about like when a child is mm -hmm. and everything and they're like um oh they're like shaking and they're kind of asking a lot of questions mm -hmm. that was me like i watched that and i was like that way so now what i know it's like oh that mm -hmm. really just hurt my little young soul so that was kind of a downer but one of the first probably the first one of the first two episode one or episode two it's probably because my big brother was just like oh yeah it was really bad and so i was like 
Okay, yeah, it was totally bad. Totally, <laughs> totally. So anyway, um, so we are, hi, hi, Royal Path. So we are gonna move on to, we've been going through the Nicene Creed one line at a time to kind of, you know, break it apart and, or, you know, kind of take a look at it, see the different angles from it. So we are up to, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, which is what we were going to talk about tonight, unless we're going to do the whole the whole thing. Okay, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, so, or one Lord Jesus Christ, uh, maker of heaven and earth. No, well, so, so, look, can we save Son of God till the next episode? Can we talk about Son of God at the next episode? I'm really. I mean, I mean, we could, um, but I think that, I don't know, maybe we could. I, I think that, um, I mean, to be honest, all of these deserve, like every word in the Nicene Creed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for we, sure. could, we could pull it all apart, but I, I don't know. I think that for the sake of a kind of more broader conversation, the other parts of it, you know, one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father. I mean, the only begotten is like its own thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, Father, yeah. let me let me let me tell you why this has been sticking out to me, and maybe this will help us in in to to figure out what we should cover, and maybe we just end up covering it anyway. But you know, with with what has been going on for everybody in the world, and particularly I think this week in particular as we're recording this, there's this grand, this, this grand narrative and this grand crisis that is all about sovereignty and where does sovereignty lie? And even I think there's this crisis within the church of who is the, like, is the state over the church? Like who is the Lord? Who is the sovereign? Who gets to decide? And people are, you know, in the states, people are trying to fight these these woke poke mandates. And some people are putting in religious exemptions. And I've been talking to a lot of people around me about these religious exemptions. And many of them who are who are faithful are saying, well, I know I'm going to lose my job. Like, there's not a question like I'm going to lose my job one way or the other because I'm not taking this poke. But I feel that it's important to bear witness with this to basically say, I believe that my, my sovereign is above this other sovereign and my sovereign is saying that I'm not supposed to do this. And so this is I'm like that to call on their sovereign. And so it's been striking me that this was this was very big for me in my understanding. And, and you have helped me immensely in this. And a lot of this has been revealed to me through, through you know, my own experiences of seeing that like, oh, I had never really understood this Jesus is Lord. Honestly, I never really had until recently mm -hmm. and until coming into the church, I had not understood this, that really like Lord and Savior was just like a, was just words. But now I really see that it's like, oh no, this is from whom I'm getting my marching orders. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from, this is, this is the person who I am bowing down to. This is the person who, who I am answering to. And so long as every so long as the state and whoever whatever authorities are going along with that, I can go along with it. But if they act in opposition, then I have a duty. I have a duty to my lord to to uh, have fidelity to that. And so, like that was what I was hoping. This is this is what's so. I don't know how how deep into into you know if if I'm sure that there is some aspect of of the sun being in there. I'm just I'm not theologically prepared to like <laughs> discuss that but that's what I was hoping that you could like expand on how we should understand the Lord the sovereign this is where I was hoping we could start sure um I I think I think it's important for everyone to to get some clarification on one point in regards of our dialogue just in general, which is, I think people may or may not realize that we enter into this with a freshness. Like we don't have any production notes really. So I think that's really important. Um, and so there's a reason for that, you know, that because 
there's all kinds of avenues and venues by which people, I mean, if someone wants just straight doc, doctrinal work and theology and all of that, like, you know, I can put something in the post notes, blah, 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 whatever. Right now, this and what everyone comes for is, is a living experience that happens through conversation and all that good stuff, right? So I think I wanna, I'm gonna throw out that disclaimer because I'd rather talk about the experience of having Christ as your Lord versus um, the kind of defining articles of it. Those things will come into play, there's an overlap, but I wanna get more into what I think people need to have fleshed out, which is what I think I've done for you, if I could say that, like- Absolutely, how you, yeah. How do you move past just like these words, Savior, Lord, and like, what does that even look like? like how do you honor an invisible king? So maybe that's the way we should look at it first, you know? Um, so I'll start with, with this. Um, if, you, if you don't know how to figure something out by not getting your way, then you're not following Christ. If you don't know how to find answers and find wisdom and joy, uh, clarity, knowledge, power, if you don't know how to find those things in, in saying no to yourself, then you, you're not gonna get it. Let me unpack the riddle this way. The crown that our king, the crown that our king wore visibly was that of a crown of thorns. Hmm. And Christ is the second Adam. The first Adam fell and transgressed our ancestor who we are all, you know, in the lineage of. And his penance, not his punishment, right? Adam's penance was that he must work the earth because it would no longer yield for him, right? He must work the earth with the sweat of his brow and it will yield thorns and thistles and all that stuff. That, that was his, that's his penance. The punishment, that's his penance. That's the thing given to him. That's the bitter root the bitter medicine that was given to him to heal him, right? That the, okay. earth, would, that the earth would produce thorns. So a penance is a, a, penance is a medicine? It's Correct. how do we understand a penance? Correct. So because of, you know, James Cagney and all the great Catholic priest movies of the 50s, I don't know if James Cagney is it's one of those guys, right? Uh, this idea of penance and, you know, the priest behind the screen and, and nuns slapping your hands with rulers, that's all just twisted. A penance is given to someone who has fallen and been wounded by their sin. And that sin has disfigured and marred their, their soul. And so in order for their soul to be mended, their soul being the visage of the, uh, of, of the kind of eternal aspect of them, if you will, medicine must be given to set right that imbalance, right? You start developing boils and all that stuff. It's because there's, there's an there's a imbalance in you. And so your body is producing and expelling these toxins, right? So balance must be put into place. So a penance is given to someone who has confessed and desired repentance from a sin, from a passion that is, is plaguing them, that has wounded them. And that penance is a medicine. And in the same way, real medicine doesn't taste good. Real medicine doesn't taste good. It, and, and there's something to that. Even the fact that it doesn't taste good, there's something indicative, so a deeper symbolic reality to that, right? So this penance is given for healing. 
It's given for purification. It's given to expel the toxin. Man working the earth and the earth not yielding for him. This is the penance for man's failure and his neglect and abuse of his duties of being the sovereign, of being the shepherd, right? So instead of being a shepherd, a sovereign shepherd and, 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 a, and a, a tender of, the, of the, the cosmic garden, if you will, man became a tyrant, a petty tyrant, right? Man became abusive. Instead of being a loving father, man became a petty and abusive, you know, drunk stepdad, like all these, all these inversions of, of the image is what happened. And so in order for that to be set right, man had to realize the crime and the tragedy that he brought into existence through his sin. And so where the earth would have been in balance and harmony and there would have been a beautiful synergy and there was infinite opportunity for growth and expansion and wonder, now there was nothing but death and finitude and and instead of opening up there was closing off all of these things the thorn is the symbol of that right the thorn is a symbol of a instead of a flowering and giving of life it's it's a calcification right and it's a it's a means of which pain is is inflicted right but that pain guards something, that thorn guards something. It, the thorn and the rose, there's this thing there, right? So the visible crown that our Lord wore was a crown of thorns. And so he, he, he has, there's this riddle that he undoes and he embraces the penance. He does what, what the first Adam could not do. He embraces the penance that the father gave. He gives, the father had desired and the whole time intended to give to man the key to his deification, which is responsibility, right? Part of understanding repentance is responsibility. A truly repentant person is someone who's truly responsible, who truly says, I'm not going to blame my wife. I'm not going to blame my sister. I'm not going to blame my daughter. I have to take responsibility. That's what a father does. That's what a man does. That's what man does. That's what man's supposed to do. And that's what Adam did not do. And that's what society has continued to perpetuate, to keep moving, is this refusal to take responsibility. And so authoritarianism is this very cheap antichrist uh, replacement for responsibility, right? A lazy man comes in and he says, I'm going to beat the crap out of you if you don't do what I say. That's what a lazy man does. A father comes in and he works and he sweats and he grinds at trying to correct and woo the heart of that child, right? The thorns, the crown of thorns, bearing that responsibility, bearing the sorrow, bearing the pain and the labor, bearing that responsibility. A king is noble, right? Noble metals, what is that about, right? What, is, what, what do we mean when we say noble, right? This ability and this willingness to give up yourself for the sake of the lower, right? So when Christ takes on this crown of thorns, the only visible crown he's ever worn, he's telling us something about his sovereignty. And he's telling us something about what our sovereignty needs to look like if we're going to have any sovereignty, any real sovereignty. The buck stops here, right? The buck stops here. Yeah. So, so Adam, so I've, I've, I've thought about this a lot, um, but this, is, this does make it more clear that Adam's, is it that Adam's primary sin is not necessarily that he ate of the fruit, but that when it's inquired, that when God inquires, why did you do this? That he then shoves off responsibility onto the woman. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to understand this is 
we have this misconception about perfection and like Adam being perfected, meaning he was never going to make mistakes. Mistakes and sin aren't the same thing per se. There's overlap, but on a practical level, the problem isn't when we make mistakes. The problem is when we, instead of learning from those mistakes, instead of growing from those mistakes, our, our hubris causes us to double down on that. Or pat, and, and passing the buck is a kind of doubling down. It's a kind of like, hey, it's still not my fault. I'm still somehow in the right. I'm still somehow not to blame, right? This is, is the, the core problem because in theory, well, first of all, Adam was gonna continue to grow in his understanding. And so that could have happened in all kinds of ways, including making quote unquote mistakes, which I would just say we could maybe understand in that light of further explorations, right? Of uh, trial and error, however you wanna kind of like make it fancy. But the point being is the real issue is when he denied that part of his image and did not take responsibility, right? Did not stand before his creator. And you see how interesting, how quickly it, it goes from like passing the buck to just, it, there's almost a kind of lie there. Like, did he really, like, did he, do I really think that God doesn't see or understand what's really happening, right? So when I get to this point of just like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I just want to say this, I want to be really clear because there is a difference between you don't understand something versus you're just, you're choosing to be thick headed. There's a total difference. And if you've never, you can see it in children. It's why with some children, you can have that patience because you can tell they're not getting it. And you're just, you're working with them and they're trying. And some kids are just like, you're not caring. There, there's a difference. And someone can look at that from the outset and be like, I can't tell the difference. You're just being capricious. No, when you know your children, you can tell there's a, there's a difference. And so in the same way, God can tell the difference with us when we are just digging our heels in because we want that thing or we don't want to take responsibility versus we don't understand, we don't get it. And I think this is, this is really key to understand because again, the sovereignty of Christ is found in infinite ways, but one of the ways that it's so personal and it's found in such a profoundly personal way is that any, anyone who is actually wanting and willing correction, you will receive it. Hmm. There, there, there is no like maybe whatever, you will receive it, you know? And as a spiritual father, forgive me for just being so over it there, but one of the biggest things I'm always having to work with is fighting off the atheism that, that my children fall into, right? Because like, oh, this is the situation. No, it's not. And then the justifications come and this and that. And I just have to look and go like, let me know when you're done with that atheist fly, you know, zooming around your head because that's all that is. You're, you're, you're literally denying the existence of God. What would be an example of that? Sure. So it, there's something so deeply poetic about, I worship this wounded king, the dead God who rose again, all that stuff, which is wonderful. It's great. It feels very good until it's time for you to pony up and do something you don't like. Then all the flowery poetry, all the stuff, it goes away and you're left with this very reality of, I'm facing something that is beyond me. I know he's there, it's there. Um, and yet there's this profound mystery that, you know, lightning isn't coming and striking me dead in my seat, but there is this unmistakable, palpable reality that I'm experiencing that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't stand it. It's driving me crazy. And 
for the moment, I'm going to ignore God and just act like I'm in a battle of the wills with my, with my priest. Or right. I'm in a battle of the wills with my husband. Or I'm in a battle, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But the whole time, what you're missing is that really you have you have fallen into the sin of Adam and you've begun to act like God doesn't really see what's happening. It's like, you know what I hear a lot? This let me let me tell you something I hear from people. This is you're talking to them. This is just a kind of phenomena for me, just being in the being in the kind of situation I am. Something is clearly wrong clearly wrong right there's a there's a, there's a very clear issue boom this is a problem right and oftentimes it's never really the thing that you think it is just like with adam it wasn't so much the fruit it was the blame shifting and the hiding right he wants we want to make it everything else we want to make it about the actual fruit but it's really not it's about us in our orientation our, in our relating are you following me okay so someone will say i'll say like okay I think that the real issue isn't so much that you ate the fruit. The real issue is that you shifted it on your sister, on your wife, and you're not really taking responsibility because this is what you're supposed to be doing. No, 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 no. It's, it was the apple it, 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 or the fruit, the fig, whatever. It was her, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm telling you, blah, blah, blah. I don't think you're here. I don't think I'm explaining myself correctly, uh, which is which is code word for, you know, I'm right. It's just not coming out the way that I want. Therefore, you don't understand. Right. It's like it's a presupposition of righteousness. It's like a, they they came into it like, no, the the foundational truth here is that I'm the righteous actor. Right. In right. this, like, I already know I'm the righteous actor. Right. So whatever you say. Right. If you don't think that, I'm just explaining it wrong. <laughs> and and and, and here, right. And here's the thing is that depending on where you're at in regards of quote unquote power dynamics, that person can be like, well, you know, I'm not going to, nor do I really want to just completely blow up my ship and just say, like, you're an idiot and blah, blah, blah. So I'll just say, like, you're just not understanding me right now. Or, or excuse me, I'm not explaining myself. And and really, that's fine. And me as a human being, I can get frustrated. I can be like, okay, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But if you take me out of the picture, take you out of the picture, what that person is left with is this weird type of atheism where we act like God doesn't exist, that he doesn't really see the situation. The problem is, is that we keep thinking of God, we keep thinking of Christ as this impersonal force yeah. like gravity. <laughs> And yeah. if you really want to start understanding this truth, not even a concept, but this principle that Christ is sovereign and that we are talking about person, capital P, then what follows is your whole orientation towards your decisions, towards your identity towards the way that you relate to other people has to begin to fundamentally change because when you begin to realize that okay there is a sovereign god who is all wise all knowing all loving by the way and merciful all that and here's the big shocker for everyone and that's not you mm -hmm. that's not me mm -hmm. i'm not the sovereign i'm not the center of the world I can be wrong, right? This is the thing that holds us up. Not holds us up, props us up, but holds us, keeps us from moving forward in this proper relation, right? So the crown of thorns, beginning to actually bear that, beginning to actually wear that penance, beginning to actually find that his, we bow our knee to him because he did what no one else would do, right? He, he did what no one else would do. And in fact, he bids us to do the same. He bids us to be like him, right? So what? Like the last couple gospels have been about 
uh, last Sunday was about out of Luke. If you love those who love you, so what? Mm -hmm. Even the unbelievers do that. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, Charlie Manson loved it, loved people who were nice to him. You know what I mean? I'm sure he, you know gave them extra acid or whatever he did. You know what I mean? Like, uh, that's not that's that's not a litmus by that's not a litmus worth worth anything. For so, what what is completely staggering and and world blowing, mind numbing, is that God shows us what it means to be God by his death. Mm -hmm. And that in showing us through death that he is the Lord of death, that's, 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 that's the checkmate. There, there, there's, there's nothing past that because every human being, no matter how beautiful, how ugly, how rich, how poor, how weak, how powerful you are, you're going to die. And you can't get past that. But those of us who have seen him and dared to take up his crown, we, we, we see others who, who now can go past that. That's what the saints are. The saints are the ones who have taken up that robe of nobility and they now are able to pass through. And they're able to do that because they bear the wounds, the markings, they bear the insignia of the king. And, and that, that alone should get somebody interested because this, not just kind of learning to cope with death, because that, that's another thing that people get twisted. Because um, Frankel, right? Victor Frankel? Yeah, they'll yep. tell you how to cope with death. Yeah. But Viktor Frankl can't tell you how to embrace it. He can't, he, he doesn't show you how to become something other through that. So on an everyday level, beginning to really embrace your cross and know what, and know what that means and start pulling, pulling away from any type of meaningless uh, kind of like pithy statements that we use that unfortunately we can turn scripture and, and spiritual truths into into these kind of like pithy statements that are just really you know flowery self-help words but really get into the meat and be like yeah picking up my cross what does that mean like that's not self-help that's that's death like that's that's something else you know I know, Father, there was a time several years ago, I would say, when I was just really dedicated to sort of these libertarian ideals and my principles, and I was pushing that forward. And I mean, these are all things that I still hold to be true now for a different reason, right? But I would often find myself in contemplation or meditation or just thinking and, and even in speaking it sometimes at like, yes, I'd be willing to die for these principles, right? And then, but then considering it now and looking back, and it's, it's, I've had to sort of reflect on it with all of the things happening that it's like, well, would you have died for your principles? Would you really have died for just these principles that was you? Like when the person, the only person that you have to answer to is yourself. Like it becomes very easy at a certain point to be like, well, and I found myself doing it on a few different things where it's like, if I sat down long enough, I could justify any behavior to myself, mm -hmm. right? I could do these mental gymnastics of it when I'm viewing myself as the sovereign and, oh, well, but maybe I just didn't understand. And then I'm doing this and I could rationalize and rationalize. And there's a lot of that happening right now, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of that happening in the world right now. I'm seeing people who six months ago, I would never do this. I would never take that. I would never suffer under this. And now they're like, oh, but I have to, I have to feed my children. And it's like, well, that's very noble. You do have to feed your children, but like what happened to this other thing, right? Like you had children then, like what you were saying all these words, but what I've found that's like the transformation is the actual 
there's there's both a there's a fear but it's it's not a fear like that i will be punished if i don't follow what is the what the lord is 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 demanding that i do if i don't live in his example it's not a fear that i'll be punished it's it's a fear that i will basically like it's a fear of spiritual death i think mm -hmm. that it's like that i'll be like cut off from this thing mm -hmm. right that it's like here's the thing that gives me meaning now like i have real meaning i have a real orientation i have like every like everything a source to go to for answers for energy for strength life. for humility life. for life mm -hmm. and that if i don't do this i cut myself off from life and it's just a completely different feeling and level of commitment than i could ever have imagined having like oh well because this principle and this principle and this principle and this principle so i was having a conversation today and um it was really interesting it, it was um mutual brother of ours and a young lady who I've met a couple of times and some gears are turning and, uh, you know, she's definitely, her eyes are open in regards of what's happening on the world stage and everything. And then a mutual, another mutual friend of ours who his eyes are opened on the world stage too, but like his worldview, his, his metaphysics, his spirituality just were, you know, complete opposites. Right. And um, we're talking about, we're, just, we're, we're, ha we're having the dance, right? And, and we're talking about like, what's the motivation behind everything, you know, the Fauci's and all this and that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, the, the key is it's not either or it's both and, right? And, but, and I'm going somewhere with this, right? It's both and. And so I'm trying to get, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to lay and paint a picture and I'm, I'm a little bit more ginger and subtle than I am generally about things, but that's just the way I, I was being led to do it today. Anyways, um, at some point in time, the move that we started talking about M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, M. Night Shyamalan, like, well, you know, love them, hate them, blah, 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 you know? And um, the one friend, um, he was like, well, you know, all his stuff, I'm just sick of the twists. And it's just like a one trick pony type of thing. And then our brother was like, I brought up Signs, like Signs is a great movie. He's like, nah, Signs was terrible. And he's like, Signs was terrible because it's like, what? It's aliens that are like, are killed by water, blah, 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 you know? And then our brother was like, was it aliens? And he was like, huh? He's like, well, was it aliens? Because you're dealing with these things that are wreaking fear and they, and they appear different depending on what your fear is. And the, the little girl whose name is Angel, like, like just showing him like, was it aliens? Or was it, you know, interdimensional beings that we call demons, right? Well, what, what was it, right? And I'm bringing that up because it was a definite like uh -huh, for for our friend, and it, and it was in this really interesting space where him realizing that oh man maybe something isn't what I thought it was mm -hmm. on a, on a level that he could accept mm -hmm. he's not going to accept me being like look man Jesus is Lord get over it you know what I mean he's not he's not going to hear that right but going like oh, maybe it isn't aliens, right? That whole kind of flash of opening the eyes real quick and then kind of going back to sleep, right? I bring that up because for all of us, we will have these moments. And ultimately there comes a time when you can only hit the snooze so many times when you go like, if I hit the snooze one more time, the jig is up today. Mm -hmm. I'll, you know, I'm not going to make it to work on like whatever that's going to be. You know what I mean? And I think we have to come to a place on an individual level where 
this awareness that something, we know it as someone, has been knocking on our door our whole lives. And when you come into that space and you go like, okay, fine, like, let me just look to see what happens. It's incredible because all of these situations begin to have a, a profoundly painful clarity mm -hmm. of what was really happening. Mm -hmm. That the whole time there was something beyond me calling me, pulling me, um, trying to bring me to an awareness of myself, first and foremost. Because that, that's the part where a lot of us never get to is like this awareness of self first, not in a self realization sense, like, you know, again, self-help, but in the sense of like, I'm a fraud. I am an idol. I, I've made an idol of my, of myself, what, whatever that is, it's going to be something painful. Mm -hmm. It, and getting back to the, the thorn, the, the crown of thorns, getting back to the cross, it's going to be something painful. And that's how you begin to know him is that pain is, is a marker and it's indicative of something beyond you. But in order to really get into that space, right? There has to be these moments. Now, when you think about someone like Father George Cauchu, who was a Romanian priest, who had a family, wife and kids, he loved his family, all this and that, but he was thrown into prison uh, communist prison in Romania for basically being a priest, upholding his priesthood, preaching to the youth, blah, blah, blah. He's there for a few, you know, for a short amount of time. I think like a year or two, whatever, forgive me the details. Gets back out. Don't do it again. Does it again. Point being is this guy, this, this, this incredible father is spending at this point more time in jail, in and out of jail, than he is free. He's spending more time as a priest in prison, in and out, than he is as a, as a free man with his family, right? You think his wife didn't have any feelings? You think his kids, what, what drives a man, right? Because it's one thing to just say like, well, I'm kind of bummed with life and there's something really exhilarating about dying for a cause, which happens to people. Right. Mm -hmm. I almost would say to some degree, anyone can kind of like die for a cause. We know that's possible because people die for, you know what I mean? Bolsheviks die for yeah. Bolshevism, right? Yeah. There's something else to live for someone. Yeah. It's easy to die yeah. one time. You just do it the one time and you're good. But like when you're, 3 a.m. and your kid won't go to sleep and you're still trying to practice you know emulating christ like you know that's not romantic or sexy or anything that's just like the everyday it's like what it's i was telling you thorns my friend it's what devin townsend was saying at his live concert he was like all these metal bands get up and they're like anger is so hard you know it's so hard to be angry and so he's like no what's hard is getting up and taking your kids to soccer practice every morning that's what's being hard like that's the true like brutality of life right there. Not well, I also I, th I think that even right now, there's a lot of people who seriously, if given the option that it's like, OK, it's not going to be that you're going to be fired from your career that you've spent 20 years, you're a pilot or whatever. It's not that you're going to be fired for not doing this thing, but it's that you're going to be lined up and shot. I think there's a lot of people who would be like, who would be, who are going to end up acquiescing so that they don't lose this position and don't have to deal with the long-term consequences yeah. of all of it, who would much rather be like, you know what? I would much rather they just lined me up on a wall and shot me. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. people who would prefer that and who, and who would not acquiesce right. if they were getting shot, but who will acquiesce if they're just going to get fired and have to reinvent their professional world it would have been better for a lot of us let me rephrase that it would have been more pleasant for a lot of us if what we know is happening would have been not so psychological and much more material 
in its in its experience, right? So in other words, so many of like all of us have lost friends and loved ones because they were like, no, I believe the narrative, I believe the government, I believe this and that. I'm, you know, uh, I'm I'm gonna go along with it because I think this is right. I love my grandma, whatever. Okay. But the problem with it is, is like we know where this, we we've known where this is headed. And now in certain parts of the world, Australia and other places, you see, you're starting to see, even though those people are still in denial about it, but you, now it's starting to be like, well, okay, that's kind of weird. Why, why are they doing it? Why are they acting like this? Okay. The point being is, I don't know what the timeline is. I want to be conservative and say, even though we all know it's going to be a lot quicker than this, but let's just say three years down the line, when things are really crazy, right? If we could, if it started out where it's going to end up, so many people would have been like, no, no, right? And that's also why it's so insidious. Because the enemy will unfold, unfolds his, his plots one, one thing at a time. He makes you threadbare by pulling the thread. It's never coming in and like, yeah. ripping off the shirt. It's like, whoa, man, <laughs> you know? Someone comes in and rips off your shirt. It's like you're putting up your dukes and you're fighting. But someone just kind of like says, hey, how you doing? Grabs a little corner, just kind of like holds it. Doesn't need to yank it. Just lets you walk away, holds it. Next thing you know, you're, you're, you know, you're half naked. That's, that is the sly, sophisticated tactic of the enemy. I mean, it's like- Either way would have woken people up. They've been like, there's no way I'm going along with it. It's like that whole, like, I don't know if there is or if there's not, that's not what I'm talking about, but the jab, if there is a microchip in it, you know, whatever, the point is, is that like in five years, someone could come along and be like, there was a microchip all along. Everyone's like, well, thank you for doing that. Like by the, like, that's the amount of like, that's the end of the road. Whereas people now would be like, well, there is no microchip. And then five years, someone comes out and says, well, there was this entire time. The point is to get them to the point where they're like, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that because you you were right to inject me with the microchip a long time ago. Yeah, Jay That's Dyer had an interesting, he, he laid out that like, this is the pattern. He said, it starts out like, one, this, th this doesn't exist, what you're saying. This thing doesn't exist. Two, okay, uh, it exists, but like, it's not that bad. And then it's like, uh, three, uh, okay, like it exists, but it's not like, okay, it's bad, but it's not terrible. And then it's like, okay, it's no, 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 no. It exists. He, he said, it doesn't exist. Then it exists, but it's good. He said, is the second thing. Then it's okay. It's not good, but it's not that bad. And then it's like, okay, it's bad, but it's not like, he said it's not ex cathedra. He was talking about uh, Roman Catholicism. So he's like, it's bad, but it's not like the the worst thing that could ever happen. And I was just like, I read that and I said, oh yeah, that's it. That's what everybody, and he was like, this is just the human process. And yeah. it's exactly what we've seen over the last 18 months. The end should be like, it's bad, but what are you going to do? Like, that's the final yes. result. That's well, the final result. It, I mean, it's kind of weird because... I'm sure we'll get back to this somehow as the Lord will show us, but it's like what this, it's what this, what the enemy did through the serpent. Well, did God really say? Yeah. Is, it, is it really? Right? The, the sowing of the doubt, the proposition of something better and beautiful, right? All of these things are, they're indicative of someone who does who who's not sovereign a sovereign doesn't need to come in and supplant mm -hmm. a sovereign doesn't need to come in and undermine that, that's another thing christ doesn't undermine he doesn't he doesn't need to come in and work all these tricks and blah 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 blah, blah. not not in that way he not won't even fight he won't even fight that's the that's the like I look back at my life, Father, and, and you when you were speaking earlier, this came up to me. And I was thinking of I've been thinking a lot lately of how many when it really struck me when you said he's been there the whole time. Because like there's this period of my life that sort of is the 
it's it's definitely a forge and it's definitely what i've in the most in repentance for like the things that i did during this time but i look at every all these decisions that i made and i look back and i'm like oh you had all these opportunities it was like any time that you would just get quiet for a little while all of a sudden here would be inspiration and it would be good like it would be towards all of the things that i'm doing now and i recall like if I look back and I'm honest, I fought all of that tooth and nail. And the things that I decided to do instead that turned out to be abject failures that were nothing but pain, this in incredible sense of pride drove me to continue, even as I saw that like, this is gonna end bad, this is gonna end bad, it, it, it made me like redouble my efforts, almost like, basically, I guess, a denial of Christ. Like, I didn't realize it at the time that that's what I was doing because I didn't have the, the framework for it. But it was like doing and, and like going to the extremes of like wickedness and knowing that I was just to ca cancel out the signal. And it's like, look, at any one of these moments, I know that at any one of these moments, had I just taken the path that was being offered to me it's the path that i'm on now like that's what's so crazy about it <laughs> you know what i mean but i fought it and it just it really it really goes to sort of this pattern that you're talking about of the individual who's sitting there hears the message from their spiritual father or hears the message from a priest who's really coming from love who's really speaking for, with the holy spirit involved and they're like no no just fighting it so hard and it's like well why are you here <laughs> you know I mean? I, I, you said a couple of things i just want to just latch onto them real quick because they were real nuggets um the first one is that he i said that a sovereign doesn't need to supplant he doesn't need, and, and that's true although i do want to like walk that back a little bit and say like but he does play some some pretty interesting. There's there are some 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 turns of the hand that he does, which is incredible. Which is somehow, some way, he's still able to bring about his will. Somehow, some way, he's still able to bring beauty out of ashes. I mean, somehow, some way, he's still able to bring forth good out of even our own disobedience. Do you see what I'm saying? Because this is the thing. When we turn to him, then he's able to, he doesn't cancel out what happened. It's not like that never happened. What it is is he now takes that and transfigures it into experience, mm -hmm. which is, eternal he takes something that's just wrong and when we submit ourselves in love and humility he's able to transfigure that wrongness and turn it into something that's eternal to turn it into a, an experience and a lesson which will form us and shape us that's the first thing it's incredible it's incredible and only god can do that only god can do it the I think second Humphrey thing Austin says that we've got more now because we fell. And that's yes. like how good how God how like how good God is that like we ended up actually with more now through Christ having to come and redeem us than we had before the fall. So yes. I just yes. gotta throw that out there, sir. And that's really important to understand because when people get into these theotic questions of like, well, why is there evil and why didn't God just do it this way and that way? It's like you don't understand that the way that it's gone down this is reaping incredible amounts of fruit you're not you just you don't have the eyes to see it like this is the perfect way the way everything's gone gone to gone to play this is the perfect way right so so there's that the other thing is that and this is kind of a hard word but oh well um <laughs> Too many people think of denial of Christ as in Columbine, like, oh, someone's going to come up to me with a gun and say, do you deny Christ? I'm going to say, no, I'm going to be a martyr. 
yeah that's that's not really the thing like it could happen but if you aren't learning to say no to yourself now then you're then you're not learning to say yes to christ and that's a denial like more than the romantic heroic like i'm not gonna do this because whatever because there's vainglory in that there's like see i'm a heroic strong man that there's there's this core of self-image at that fantasy where the denial of christ happens so often with people is simple obedience right god gave you that warning how many times man are you going to keep watching that stuff how many times you're going to keep drinking how many times you need to keep yelling at your daughter like that? How, you know what I mean? How many times are you going to like, whatever, you know, you're skimming off the top, you know what I mean? And that conviction that the Holy Spirit brings, right? Every time that we just turn that volume down, we just shut it, we just shut him up, whatever. That is a fundamental denial of Christ's sovereignty in your life. And that's a hard word. I know, I know it is, but it's the truth. Because getting back to that other thing of, well, if they just showed their hand right now and just went buck wild totalitarian, all kinds of people would wake up and not, not deal with it, right? Well, it's the same thing here, right? Like, if you don't understand, it's the inverse, excuse me, it's the inverse. If you don't understand that, you're not going to be able to really stand in that day if you can't stand in the, in, in the hour, <laughs> right? You're yeah. not going to stand in the day if you can't stand in the hour. That's good, yeah. And that that's where the sovereignty, like for me, I, I this is probably a weird thing. I don't know. We're, we're just in the midst of it. Someone might be like, "How's this? Got, what's this got to do with Jesus as Lord? So, but like for me, this is everything about what it means because his lordship isn't about something out there. And I know there's some, I'm sure there's some keyboard warrior clacking away and is going to say, this is a hyper individualistic blah, 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 whatever. I'm just, I'm just telling you what my experience has been in that um, I'm not telling you, I'm not sharing with you my thoughts about, you know, what, how Christ can, can, how you, inter I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying this is, this is, this is my experience and it has not been pleasant, but I would not change it for anything. Right. I, I just, I think I said it before, like, that's how I, that's how I know Christ is not only real, but is the Lord of my life. Because at this point, I got a lot of crosses and I wouldn't trade any of them in. I'm able to say that only by his grace, right? Only by his grace, I'm able to say, there's these things in here, they've been painful. I don't particularly enjoy them, but I, 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 I wouldn't trade them for anything. That's what sovereignty of Christ looks like in the life of, of a true subject. Well, the sovereign bring the sovereign, the meaning flows from the sovereign, right? It's like, why is the king's face on the coin? Like the value flows from the sovereign. And then why does it say by the grace of God on the Spanish silver dollar? Why does it say in God we trust? Because it's like, well, the so even the king's meaning, the meaning of the king, the meaning of the crown, the earthly king flows. From, it has to flow from the sovereign, so. like the ultimate sovereign. That's that's fantastic because that's ex that's exactly what I want to talk about. So we're, I kind of wanted to ask really quick. Um, so power, right? Sovereignty, like where authority comes from. So at the beginning, you know, everything was in alignment, right? So then <clears throat> the power is thrown out of whack with the fall and our, our our like relationship to it, correct? So then. I kind of just wanted to know, and it's kind of like, 
um, I guess it's kind of the same thing as last week a little bit in the sense of like, where, where is this power, like it's distortion and what this distortion of the power and what waves it like really manifest right now? Cause I know we've been talking about that, but like in what way, like, I guess like, why do, okay, example, why do I not like police officers? Like, why is that authority? Why is that so? Mm -hmm. Why do I see that? And I'm like, everything you're about, I'm not about. No, I'm not really, not literally. That's not what I'm saying. But like, why do I? Okay, I think you got the question. Why do I? Why don't I like cops, Father Carlo? Can you tell me that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, this kind of, let's almost get this back to the father in some regards. And it, but it's definitely why so many people. Um, why there's such contention with Christ because you'll have people make these concessions of like well you know Jesus was a cool dude great teacher blah 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 but there's a hard stop when he's the son of God there's mm -hmm. a hard stop when he's the Lord when he's when he's what's the hard stop it's authority they don't want his authority okay so um, what is what what is power Okay, well, let's let's do a little. Let me give a little demonstration, right? <clears throat> if you have, um, you know, anybody have money on their pot on, on them? You have a dollar, quarter. I got nothing. Mm -hmm. No. I got so, nothing. well, if I hold up, let's say, there's a credit card. Okay. Can you get that right up on the camera? Yeah. <laughs> they cover the numbers there for you. So, so this credit card, right? Everyone can hold it. Like you can see the credit card, right? Um, and if you hold a credit card in your hand, you can do this experiment, right? Like you hold the credit card in your hand, right? Now, I want you to imagine a credit card. Just imagine one. Can you, can you picture it? Hmm colors, numbers, you, you have it, right? And if we were to, let's say, you know, duplicate this somehow, make a, make a fake one, right? Materially speaking, it, it'll look exactly like this, whatever, but you know, sometimes you'll get a card and it's not activated, you have to do the numbers, you know what I'm talking about, blah, 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 okay. So which one, has power because I would only tell the you, real only the real well no they're all real right the they're the one the, the the authorized one the that's one right. where authority has put their stamp their imprimatur right. on it that's right that's the one that has power right which therefore we would say it's the real one right but power is about it it is it, it's able to operate and function as it's intended. This this one, which is activated, is able to operate and function as intended. The one that you have in your mind, it's very real. I mean, you if you have a photographic memory, you can get down to like little etches and scratches. Like it's real in that sense, right? You can give such a strong description of something that someone would be able to make, you know. A life, a, a lifelike exact sketch of it. You, you see what I'm saying? It's real. The the one that is a counterfeit, quote unquote, is real too. You can look at it. It it, it functions to some degree. But the one that has the authority, the one that has power, is the one that's functioning as it was intended to. Now, follow me on this. The reason why the problem with cops, same thing with priests right now, is that. People look at a priest, and because of what the devil has done through the Latin church, primarily, is distorted that image, hmm. that true image of authority, right? The cop is this distorted image of authority, right? It's like... Homer Simpson 
and Al Bundy. Mm -hmm. They are the distorted image of fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Al Bundy, Homer Simpson are incompetent. Their incompetence is sickening, right? They care, not, they care neither for their wife nor their children, nor for their own image as men, nor for their authority. That lack of responsibility, keyword, lack of responsibility is disgusting. It, it disgusts us on an ontological level. So the reason why you don't like cops and the reason why people don't like priests fundamentally is because the icon that they've been given is a distorted one. It's a one of broken, perverted, false, misused, mishandled authority. If I, if I may take it to like a, like a current event, right now the police union and in Chicago and a whole bunch of officers, like the head of the police union, fraternal order of the police and the mayor are in a row over these mandates. And today the mayor said that the, that the head of the fraternal order of police, the police union and, and the police officers associated who, who were going along protesting her order were trying to start an insurrection. The mayor, right, who it's like, wait a minute, the mayor of a city is like the head of the police department. Like this should be, this is one of the primary things that the mayor's over. And then it's like, well, the police are not answering. Clearly the police don't view the mayor, don't view the mayor's authority as being worth anything. And clearly the mayor doesn't view them as, she views them as an antagonistic organization that's somehow within this. And then it's like, Where's the authority? Because I think that the correct structure would be they're all answering to a higher authority, right? Like, isn't this what we were talking about? Kind of the idea of like the, the like holy Russia, the idea of like, what is that supposed to be? It's not that the czar is necessarily over the people. It's that like the czar is supposed to be a representation of the kingdom, but everybody's eyes are on the kingdom, right? Like, and I think in that case if people felt like oh my eyes are on the kingdom their eyes are on the kingdom we all have the same sovereign then i don't think i have a problem with police so so let me let me say this the, the reason why i did the whole thing with power um and power being from operating as it's intended this is this is the problem people see that cops have authority people see priests have authority People see mayors and heads of governments have authority, but something fundamentally, something inside them fundamentally knows that this is something's twisted and wrong. The bastardization. The bastardization, the homerization, the owls, the allyization, right? It's the Al Bundy, it's the Homer Simpson, it's the incompetence, it's it's all those things that takes that power and says no. And, and I would I would submit. This is one of the direct works of, of the demonic forces, is to fundamentally decouple the icon of authority and power and recouple it with a twisted, impotent, take the, take the true icon, decouple it from power, and recouple it with, with incompetence. People, I mean, I've talked with quote unquote Christians who have been like, you know, they gets back to this theotic thing. Theodicy is fundamentally of the devil from my perspective. I know I'm gonna have a philosopher like correct me, but like what I've seen, it's fundamentally this question of like, well, God's doing it wrong and God's justice is wrong, which ultimately is about God's authority is invalid because God's God's incompetent or God's neglectful or whatever. Hey, let, let's just go ahead and pretend like maybe, a, I mean, nobody on this call, but maybe like a listener might not know what that word is you just said just a second ago, the theod. Theodic. Theodic. Hey, let's just pretend that maybe out there who's listening, not me, but someone yeah, else, this, I don't know what that word means. <laughs> yeah, so this, this, 
Very good. This question of, of, of evil, right? This question of evil and God's sovereignty, like why does God allow evil, right? Um, so this, this is why I think this is really important because this is part of the reason why, um, you know, I'm not getting into like Jacques Ellul and like other sophisticated kind of like, like philosophers who have an anarchist slant, but generally as people understand anarchy, generally as people understand, you know, this kind of like D like highest level of decentralization, they don't, what they don't understand is like, it doesn't like nature doesn't work that way. Like nature fundamentally doesn't work that way. And the reason why nature fundamentally doesn't work that way is because, because of God, right? And so the problem is, is this coupling of the, of the icon of authority with incompetence, with abuse, with, with lack of love, right? So you fundamentally recognize whether you acknowledge it or not, there's a part of it that recognizes not only the, the value and the, the, not only the value, but your need for authority. You want authority. The problem is, is that it's been presented in these twisted icons. Is that a me thing or an institution thing? I it, Both and. Okay, of course. But isn't it even, doesn't, isn't it even, I mean, it starts in the family, doesn't it? I mean, if your icon of authority from your mm -hmm. father and your mother and your family around you is distorted, it's, it's kind of curtains for you, mm -hmm. right? Like in a lot of ways, unless you have some massive transformation and who, and, <laughs> and that's that, not going to happen secularly. <laughs> right. And, and that, and that brings us to that, the, you're, you're underhanding pitching it, right? That's exactly where we end up now is because those of us who come to the end of those conclusions, which that's a mercy by God in of itself. Like if you get to the point where you realize everything is empty and hollow, what's next, right? That's a blessing. For real. And then you're in this place where you can actually, you know, surrender. And I know for a lot of people, it's like, what does that mean to surrender, right? Well, let me tell you what it means to surrender. It means to embrace doing the thing that you don't want to do <laughs> that's what it means to surrender crown of thorns right it's thank you it's the crown of thorns and and then once you when you once you do that and you get it something pretty amazing happens and the invisible king starts becoming a little bit more visible it's like there's a little shimmer there that you can like whoa what was that mm -hmm. you know kind of like a predator the predator move like whoa oh what was that you know what i mean not that I want to compare the Lord to the predator, but you get what I'm saying. There's, there's, there's that shimmer that happens when you start saying like, make some arguments. I'm not crazy. No. no. You know, I'm not crazy. There, there, there's something to this. And I think that this fundamental issue of authority is really important because look, everybody, if you're listening, you got to become orthodox. Okay, great. I said it. So you're not going to be able to really enter into and get past the flowery language that we talked about at the beginning until you begin to embrace this aspect. Because when a priest says something that you don't like, if you can't embrace that, then you're, then you're not getting it, right? Now, full disclaimer, right? I'm not talking about something immoral or abusive, right? Like that's not, that's not the thing, right? But when someone says, hey, you know, um, you may be right, but for the time being, just try to be kind to your wife for a little while. You know what I mean? Or like, hey, I, I get it, you know, work is tough, whatever, but you really should reconsider having a six pack every night when you come home. I mean, I mean, I don't want to go, you know, ad nauseum about all these examples, but it's going to be something real low level and simple. See, these are the types of things that break people. A priest, well, their their immediate response is like, "But that's not the problem, Father." It, like right. that's not that's not that, that that the six packs not a problem. I I'm fine with that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's it. 
that's exactly it. And so if you can go in there with this understanding of like, I want to see the invisible king. I want to see the invisible king. Well, if you want to see the invisible king, let me give you some, let me give you a pointer, pun intended, crown of thorns. It's going to be in that embracing of the thorn that's found in the rough wooden cross in the crown of thorns. That's where you're going to, that's where the invisible king will start becoming visible. Oh, so slightly, oh, so slightly. But that's the path for this to not just be some kind of weird mass, because it's not a weird mass delusion. Um, it's a very real thing. And I would, I would say it like this, how else could he do it? How else do you, how else do you invite free beings into your lordship without destroying or denying their freedom and their own autonomy? How else do you do it? Because he's not a king like men and he's not a tyrant like the demons wish to be. How else do you take free creatures? How else do you take creatures that you endowed with the very essence of what you are, which is freedom? And how do you maintain that very, how do you maintain that gift without sullying it? Because these people who are fools, who want to be compelled by some external force, that's not, that's God, God could not work that way. See, here, here's the other, here's the other, here's the inverse of this, which is the scariest thing about the sovereignty uh, and the Lordship of Jesus is that he is all about freedom, which is terrifying. Yeah. Which is so terrifying, right? Authoritarianism, psh, that's easy, man. That's why the world is la lapping it up right now. People, people are like, yeah, 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 authoritarianism. And I'm like, I look at people and go like, mm, I don't really want to hear some guy who's, you know, spending his time, no offense to anyone, please forgive me, it's late. But, you know, if you're spending your time playing video games and smoking bowls, don't talk to me about freedom. You know, if you don't know how to move past your own self-indulgence, you don't know about freedom. You know about liberty, you know about license, but you don't know about freedom. And the reason why I'm saying it like that is because I've been that guy. So like, I know what it means to be chained by your pleasures. That's, you know, that's brave new world, right? None of those people were free, right? This freedom, that's, that's why asceticism, that's why an orthodoxy without asceticism is not orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Because asceticism is, is the key that like opens the padlock that has all the chains around you, right? You this is what, this, is, this, 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 can we stay on this for just a minute, Father? Because mm -hmm. this is one of the most, I think, difficult things as people who have either known me or are just inquiring, who have no real experience with orthodoxy, but who have experience with Christianity mm -hmm. and Christians, mm -hmm. they have a very difficult time when I'm like, no, yes, there's beliefs, but it's Christianity is a practice. Mm -hmm. It is a, it is, you're going to do things that are difficult and they're like but do you believe this do you believe this and i'm like can we not talk about like mm -hmm. i understand that you want to talk about this because you're used with christians that you sit down and you talk about i believe this i believe this but there's no praxis there's no practice besides but i read the bible and you know i go to church on sunday and it's like can we stick on this a little while about like participation in the kingdom participation with the sovereign is not just about a set of beliefs and saying, I believe this, and I'm going to go out and tell people I believe this, but it's like about action, pra praxis, because that's where I think orthodoxy is totally different from at least what most people in the West understand to be Christianity. Even the so, demons believe. 
Yeah, I mean, the demons read the Bible and go to church every Sunday, too. <laughs> Love it. I mean, believe me, as a priest, I see them show up every every Sunday. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, you know? Um, yeah, the other thing about that is people, people think that belief is acquiescing to a set of doctrines. That's not belief. That's not faith. Um, trust right? And, and trust can only come from experience. And so um, I, I think it's real important to understand this because one of the things about belief in that sense that you're talking about, it's a kind of weird cousin to the scientism, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because you can take belief and it's like, I have mastery. I know For some people who might stumble on us and be like, what is this crazy fool doing with the creed? Oh my gosh, right? What I'm hoping is coming out of this, which isn't necessarily, it's on purpose, but it's not scripted. What I'm hoping that's coming out of this is that people will stop looking at the creed as just like, let me kind of like get the magic formula, say these words, this is what I believe and therefore, you know, it's magic, boom, boom, boom. No, 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 no. Like there's real life and real meaning and real experience tucked deep within these words, within these dogmatic statements. But the trick is you can only unearth those experiences through praxis. You can't, you can't, it's impossible to get there just by this. You, you can't do it, right? And the only way to get it from here to here is through praxis, is through asceticism, is through prayer as the ancient church has understood prayer, not as just supplication and asking for something, but as a state of openness before God, before the heavens, an openness of the inner life. Like, we have to get to this place where the crown of thorns, again, this is the thing, right? You not only can see, let me back that up. You're not only willing to, to reach out for these thorns to potentially embrace them and put them upon your head, but you can actually see what they are. And, and the reason why I reverse that order is because I have found in my life, it's, it's much more fruitful if I get to a place where I'm like, okay, my heart's ready. I'm willing to, I, I know I need this. I need the penance. I know I need this medicine. I, I'm so desperate now. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing isn't working, right? Mm -hmm. And that moment, then it becomes crystal clear to me that, that it was really right in front of my face. I just couldn't see it, right? But if I'm looking for the thorn, there's still this kind of mastery, right? It's like, it's not a holy grail. It's not the holy grail in regards of like, I want to find it and use it as a talisman and blah, 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 right? It's, it's the other way around. It's my heart has to be ready. And then when it's ready, I'll see it. Let, let me, I know I'm forgiving, I know I'm what you're going on, but like, it's, it's, it's naming, right? Naming the king. Uh, the, the, the great general, he has leprosy and he hears about the prophet Elijah and he goes to, he leaves Syria and goes and finds the prophet. And he says, you know, I want to be cured of leprosy. And, and uh, Elijah says to him, well, go wash three times in the Jordan. And Naaman balks at it. He's like, Pfft. there's, far greater and more cleaner beautiful rivers in syria have i come all this way to to be mocked naaman's servant says basically master if he had told you to conquer a thousand kingdoms you would have done it and such a simple thing you're not you're not you're not even willing to, to do it right there's a vain glory in it yeah there was like i'm still the i'm still a general i may be humbled by the leprosy and I may be humbled enough to come and ask you, O oh mighty prophet, 
but God forbid I would, you know, look foolish, right? This bathing in the Jordan three times, the muddy Jordan, and he was healed. He was, he was healed. This, this is the thing that has to happen to us, I think, first. Because we want to think that God, I'm going to become Orthodox and God's going to call me to have this tragic, heroic martyrdom and blah, blah, blah. All the self-importance, all the self-importance, right? But if you do it in this other order of, well, let me just get my heart really ready, actually, to where, like, if you want me to bathe in the Jordan three times, Lord, I'll do it, right? And then he reveals it to you and it's like, oh, I should have been kind to my wife the whole time, right? Like what, it will be so innocuous to you. That in itself would be humbling because it's like, what? There is no grand quest for me, sire? Yeah. <laughs> Prostrations and acathists can be easy sometimes when it comes to like not having to like change your kid while you're hungry and your other kid is screaming at you because they're mm -hmm. hungry. Mm-hmm. And part, of, and part of that that needs to happen for people is that the prostrations and the agathist and the prayer actually becomes a reward. Mm. So that, that's, that's when you kind of level up and you start cooking with gas. And when, it, when you no longer see the praxis as the bargaining chip with the God, you know, T-H-E-G-O-D, the God. Okay, let me offer this to the God to appease him right? A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. The thing that appeases God is a broken heart. And the prayer, the prostration is the means to get that broken heart. Not the other way around, right? We don't, we don't offer our praxis to God. The demons don't eat, <laughs> right? Uh, so it's not about how little you ate and how many prostrations you made that God cares about. Did you, did you, from your lack of eating and your submitting of your body in prostrations, from your like actually praying and, and, and refusing to want to be distracted by the Xbox so that you could actually get some contrition in your heart so you can be sorry for what you did? That's what, God's, that's what God's looking for. So the life in the church, the praxis is the means to actually make your heart a, an offering. And that's why it's a sacrifice because, you know, Cyprian's in good shape. Him doing 10 prostrations doesn't really mean anything because whatever. But if I say to him, yo, 200 prostrations, it's like, Whoa, right? That's gonna, right? And that penance that's given, it's given to him. Whereas for Andrew, it could be like, okay, two prostrations, and he's out, right? whatever that is. Like, oh, come on. I could do I'm two. just saying, baby. <laughs> I'm just saying, baby. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the penance is given by the spiritual father according to the, the need in the, of, of each person, that there's that personal aspect. And the purpose is not to make you not to punish you like you're gonna be sorry for what you did it's like god willing this is the thing that's gonna like allow a softness to come so that your heart can actually be broken because that's that's what as a priest that's what i'm trying that's the that's the purpose of praxis is that your heart will be broken and then when your heart is broken the the tears wash your mind the the tears begin to renew you does that make sense right so that that's it's, it's the definition of the word the, the real definition of the world word purgatory right it's purgative mm -hmm. that's purifying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i should have done this at the beginning i'm sorry father but what is what is praxis it's practice yeah. same word sure i know but like i mean there's like a definition from that orthodox psychotherapy like <laughs> that yeah, I just thought maybe you're gonna like bust that out really quick. And oh, like, do you want to bust it out? I don't have it memorized. I don't have it with me either. I just know that there was something, <laughs> but I didn't know like, yeah, that if so like praxis is, pra praxis is the participation in the ascetical life of the church. 
And the ascetical life of the church consists of her liturgical life, right? Her liturgical life being the services offered, corporate prayer, private prayer, times of fasting, right? Um, this is this is praxis, right? And the praxis is a um, a direct embodiment of our our dogmas, our hymnography, our doctrines, right? All of these things can can and should be encountered, not just on a cerebral level, but on a kind of holistic level. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I mean, I mean, hey, I already knew what it was. I've read Orthodox Psychotherapy, the books that you, that I just don't have it on me, or maybe I do. But um, Praxis so is a big Praxis, like, this is a big problem in the sort of broader community of people that let's say I've been a part of and something that I, I have always very much valued. I think my because my sort of, let's say my spiritual path has been one that has not been as cerebral as it has been experiential, that it's been more like, I'll tell you after I have the experience, I'll tell you what I think about it, right? It's just very much like, and and coming to understand that this is very much like in reading the fathers, the church fathers, and just like that it's very much like, okay, here's an experience. I mean, that's even what the gospels are like a description of an experience that these individuals are actually have actually had, you know what I mean? And so it's like, all of these things are, are coming from, and St. Paul, everything is like, these, this is coming from out of experience. And it's just this, this was always what turned me off about Christianity as I understood it before I encountered orthodoxy was that it was just very clear to me. Like if somebody stopped me on the street and they were going to evangelize to me, some like Baptist or whatever was going to evangelize to me, it became very clear to me very quickly that these were just words mm -hmm. that they had no experience. Cause you can tell, you know what I mean? You could tell when somebody is talking about a place they've been to or a place they've only read about. Yeah. There's a huge difference. <laughs> and like immediately I was like, this, se this seems like like LARPing to me, right? Yeah. But then as I encounter Orthodox and particularly Orthodox priests, it's like, oh, these are everybody's talking. And I mean, even as you say today, Father, that you're like, well, let's just talk about experience. There's not... This is just like not in the Protestant world. And for me, like the experience that I have with Catholic priests as well, it's not there either. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I'm sure there are some that have had that can speak in that way. It's just does not seem to be there. And so it's like this notion of Christianity as praxis, I think is and and spiritual praxis, not just like because I see a lot of people that I'm calling them now Christianists. This is like an unfortunate thing that's happening to some of these libertarians that are like, well, the structure of the institution of the church is good for organizing society. So like we should do that. And it's like, no, the structure of the church mm -hmm. is was is there from the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit has been building that structure through revelation to church fathers since for 2000 years. And it's well, that, that see, they can't get they can't get their heads around this. Yeah, see, the problem still is though, is that they want the stuff, but they don't, they still want to reject Christ's authority. Do you see that? It still comes back down to they want to reject Christ's authority. And you know, Christ undermont <laughs> Christ undoes the powerful. Because he shows you I, I He's, he's wild. I just, the St. Silwan the Athenite, I, I would, I would encourage everyone. Um, there's a, there's a book that St. Sophronia wrote about in the first one, which is Wisdom from Mount Athos. And then there's the bigger one of his, uh, St. Silwan the Athenite. It's a larger, uh, his life and his work. Super important because um, if you're just getting into orthodoxy or if you've been orthodox and you've just kind of been at that superficial level, wherever you're at, I always encourage you to just 
pick up and start and read that that wisdom from Man Athos. And it's not necessarily about trying to like apply what Saint Silvan is saying in there. Rather, it's about just hear the words that are being said, like because they're experience. He had an experience of God, which is like, yo, that is what what else can you how else would can you explain the stuff that he's teaching he's talking like keep your mind in hell and despair not what no man says those words like you can tell you can tell when there's a you know a holy father has an inspired word it's good it's like oh that's good right yeah and then there's the words from god like One's great, but there's a, I mean, there's a chasm of difference, qualitative difference. Keep thy mind in hell and despair not. No man can say that. The fact that we utter that, like God spoke those words. I almost want to become an old school Jew and not even say that because like saying, saying that God uttered that. If you understand what I'm saying to you, if you can feel it, there's, the words of God are so simple, but there's no end to them. Yeah. They're, they're supreme infinite. elegance. Supreme, supreme elegance. Supreme elegance. Yeah. Supreme elegance. And they're infinite. It's just like, whoa. You can yeah. chew on that every day, all day, and never come to the end of it. I right? remember one time I was talking to you and I was saying that, like, I was reading, thinking this in different interpretations of the gospel or something like that. And you were like, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? I was like, uh-oh. And you're like, that's eternity. And I was like, oh, like all these different, like though you could even rearrange stuff. And it's still like, it's just this whole other, other like indifferent, entirely different thing. That's just like, no matter which, like you could pull back layer that it's infinite. It's 100% infinite. And like I've, the limited experience I have with that, that's absolutely true. And this is the thing, this is the kind of like positive aspect of the sovereignty that we, that I have experienced, right? So negative, not necessarily negative as in like bad, but negation, you know what I mean? The thing that pulls away the crown of thorns and the suffering and the denial of self and asceticism. This is the thing that peels away. But that positive aspect of it is, is this thing that we're talking about where when these words are uttered, when you encounter these words, you realize these words are life. These, these, are, these are words that on my deathbed, I'll, something will still be with me. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That's, that's you begin to encounter the sovereignty on another end, where it's like only he can provide you with these things that, um, a man who has had women and 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 money and you know wealth and and, and um, influence and all that. A man who would have those things in unlimited amounts. Soon enough, will find the end to them. There's a bottom to that. Yeah. One simple phrase from the Beatitudes. One the one simple phrase of keep that mind in hell to spare not. There's a wealth in there that's inexhaustible. That's what we mean when we say Lord Jesus, right? I can encounter all kinds of really great, trippy, you know, kind of mystical statements, right? You can, you could read the Vedas, you can read the Upanishads, you can read that stuff and be like, ooh, that's kind of okay. There's some, that's there's some wisdom there, whatever. It's. <laughs> Reading the most pithiest thing in, in the Upanishads, the Quran, whatever, it's like, it's like talking to, <laughs> it, it's so, it, it's like looking at my dog and going like, okay, Bane, like, I, I know you want this bone. It's like, yeah, there's communication. That's great. Like, this is wonderful. And then there is this most supreme elegance. It's like, there's the qualitative difference of the words of God. Can, I mean, they're the words of God. They come from the ruler of all. When you, when you encounter that 
And when that becomes your meat and your drink and your wealth, that's another sign that you're, you're on that path. That's another sign that you're, you're really getting it. And that's, that's the sign of now I'm ready to start kind of like really bending my knee. Because now I'm no longer just bending my knee to a self-serving, um, self-aggrandizing ideal. Lord, I will never deny you. I will never allow you to go to jail. Peter, before the cock crows thrice, you're going to, you know, you're going to deny me, right? That's Peter, mm -hmm. right? That's that grand, glorious, I will never allow you to be taken in prison. Uh, actually, you're going to deny me, right? Then you need to be brought back down. And it comes to the simple thing, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, right? You can, you can find your glory on a battlefield, but you'll find the Lord's glory in service and in humility, right? There's this, there's this been this pattern, Father, in conversations that I've had, and I'm realizing as, as you're saying this, what's, what's coming to me is, it's funny because I've had a few conversations where I've said this to other people, but now I'm seeing it in myself that there's been a pattern that has been coming up in conversations that I've been having with people around me, friends, and that I've been having this very strong kind of visceral reaction, negative reaction to, and I'm realizing that what I'm seeing in them is something that I did myself and as i look as i'm talking about all of these things that it's like this was this was the enemy at work and and what it is is it's and, and it, it's it's going directly to this idea of being able to discern and it's not that difficult when you encounter these the the, the utterances of god it's not that difficult to discern them if you're if you're not in active denial but it's like one of the things about such words is the realization that like no one could think themselves to this. It's like, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter all of this, that you couldn't, you couldn't think yourself to these things. And in some ways, that's how you know. And that's how intelligent people know. Like, oh no, this is definitely from somewhere else because there's no amount of sitting and thinking and strategizing that I could do. And what I'm, what I, I'm seeing among so many people. And I, I realize right now that like, oh man, <laughs> did you ever do this? And are you ever not reacting to like your shame that you did this so many times is like this running of simulations in their head, this intellectualizing like, oh, here's this problem, even if it's an existential problem and, and let me think my way through it, right? Let me think, let me think this out as opposed to let me pray on this. Mm -hmm. And like, I realized that in myself that it's like, I'm, I really no longer because I have seen the, the fruits, like I no longer, it's like, I'm not even think about this. I'm not even going to start, man. I'm going to pray on this. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, why, why am I thinking on this? Like, I, let me just go to the, to the source and get this because there's nothing I can do. That's even going to be close to the, the smallest inkling that I'm going to get. Can you still feel the foolishness in that? Oh, it's like, Father, honestly, I'm realizing now that I am reacting with sh shame in myself because I'm seeing these very intelligent people doing this intellectualization and writing down all of these things and making up new words and like going through and, oh, it's this and that and drawing on this person that they read and this and that. And I'm like, oh, I did that. It's yeah. so like, I'm so viscerally opposed to it because I see the old me and how, what a, a damn fool actually. Like that's really yeah. honestly what I would say. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, like this, this whole thing of us talking and uh, this project, I, I mean, I, I'm repenting of the stuff myself, man you know calling and i get it academic rigor and all that stuff blah 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 but you know that doesn't move anyone's heart and i'm doing this i'm spending this time 
because I believe the Lord, and I know how she's, they know it. The Lord's called me to the hacky sack ministry. Like I, I get it. Everyone, you know, everyone's finds themselves in the ministry that they love, you know, but like, I, I really believe, you know, and maybe we'll talk with, tell the story sometime, but like, you know, you, you know what happened here. And like, just, there's a lot going into doing, doing this project. And for me, a big part of it, even in the way that we're approaching it, of not having all this pre-production and, you know, it's like, God forbid anyone thinks that I, I don't take our tradition seriously. This is like, I'm just being lazy and like, I'm not studying. And like, I understand I could be making mistakes, but like, I really am trusting in the Lord in this because I, I, I think what people need so desperately, and this is what I was saying earlier, like the, the thing for me and my priesthood is to get people to understand that he is real. That you don't need a script. You don't need to have everything polished. Um, that he's real. And um, if it's if it's possible for anyone to get, and God, I, I hate saying this because I know for some people they're gonna like puke when they hear this, but like with I with every fiber of my being, if someone can make the transition because of seeing or hearing something that's coming across here, to me that's it because um, it is the hardest. It's the easiest thing in the world to approach the church and just get swept up and just like, I got to learn all this and I got to do all that. And I got to find all the hoops and you, I got to like know all the things. That's not, that's not the church. That's not what orthodoxy is about. Yeah, there's some things you got to learn, but you have to learn those things because we serve a king. Like you got to learn those things because when you're dealing with holiness, it's no joke. But that like, yeah, that's there. But you don't have to learn those things so that you can like prove like you're in the club. And for a lot of people, they, they'll spend, if I can keep someone from spending years in that shallow place, then praise, praise God, because a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. And that's what people just, I just, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of people aren't getting that. I think a lot of people, there's so much really interesting and fun content out there but i don't really care i don't really kind of care about that um i want people to get the real stuff and the hard stuff i want people to know like this is what it's going to cost you but also this is what it looks like to encounter the living god well father this i i, I feel like a lot of people are going through you know that 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 very sort of heartfelt tearful moment that jordan peterson had with jonathan Pajo where he said, quite honestly, you know, if Christ is real, if this is all real, the mystical aspect of this is all real, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And he broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I would have to say that, yes, of, yes, of course, it's terrifying. Um, yes. Like it's absolutely terrifying. And, and I'm speaking, you know, for myself, I'm speaking from a place where like I had experiences where I went to approach these things. So it's not that I'm any less terrified about it. It's just that I recognize the realness of it. And I recognize that like, okay, tremble in awe of it, but that doesn't make it go away. Like, like you can't, if you, if you decide you're just going to ignore it, it doesn't mean that these forces aren't acting upon you. Right. So it's like, for me, I, I, I have to do it. But I think that there is for, for many people, and I've seen it, like it's this, it's this approach. And then if I go further, I can't turn back because it'll be real. Like if I go further than this, it'll be real. And the, the, the idea that, well, maybe I could just get academic about it. And then like, I'm in, but I don't have to experience any of these things. Like, I don't have to actually feel it. I don't have to experience it. I don't have to acknowledge that, that it's real. But the, because I don't think that there's an understanding of the trade-off. Like, I think that there's the understanding of the punishment aspect, which is even in Orthodoxy, that's different than like in Catholicism or Protestantism. Like, 
that the Lord would punish, but there isn't the understanding of like, no, it's service to the great, to the greatest and wisest King that is possibly imaginable. What could be a better life than that? I don't know. And I've tried, you know, um, I've tried with my limited resources as a human being to, to experience those things. And I haven't, I haven't found it, Ducks. you know, I haven't found it. And, um, you know, my worst day in service of him beats my best day outside of, outside the gates. I don't know. I mean, I got some pretty rough days, man. <laughs> you know, I've had some pretty rough days. Uh, but it's still, I mean, you know, I, I, there's moments still, you know, I'll be walking through saying a lot and it'll just hit me. I'm just like, how did I ever exist without the knowledge of him? I, I don't even, I, I can't even remember. It's just like, it's, it, it boggles my mind. And that's the thing, you know, the love that he gives us is incredible. But there's also something so just great when you start to really develop a love for him. Um, you know, I, I think I might have said this at, on the father episode. I don't, I don't know, but I remember asking my dad what he liked better, being a son or a father. And my dad, to my shock, <laughs> he said he didn't even like waste a second. He's like, oh, son. You know, I like being a father better. I like being a father better. My dad was a my dad was a good dad, but you know, there's moments where my kids they hate me, um, and there's, you know, it's 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 like a weird quantitatively being a dad is like so tough you'll spend nine out of ten just in pain whether because they're hurting you or because you're just hurting from not wanting to, to die not wanting to put that crown of thorns on your head you know? but that one moment and it's not even it's not even the moment where it's just like oh i love you daddy it's the moment when you look at them and just, you love them for them. Like that moment qualitatively, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like loving another human being for, for the sake of them. Not that they're gonna reciprocate, nothing like that. That is something that can only come from God, I think. I don't, I, I don't, I, I, <laughs> I have experienced it. I don't experience it as much as I should because I'm, I'm a terrible, wicked, sinful, selfish man. But I have experienced moments where I've just, I've seen God in the face of my children. And I don't know that when, that's something that it's eternal. It's, it's eternal, and that joy of being a father and looking upon someone with such love—that's uh, just an echo of what he has for us. Like, but the thing is, is we can we can begin to never love him as a father, always as a son. But there's something about just the sweetness and the goodness of even the chastening, you know, like, man, I, I love I love the correction. Like, <laughs> I feel so sorry for people who don't know, who don't have that awareness of him because that correction is so sweet and beautiful and it's, it's so life-giving. There's, and there's no other, there would be no other means of proper correction because in the same way that, I mean, this is what I'm experiencing is that, that I, like, I've been a pretty disciplined person in my life, you know, 
Um, at a certain point, I wasn't, but I, I, I think I had an internal transformation maybe in my early 20s, and I've been pretty disciplined, and my life shows that fact, right? And it's given me a lot of freedom in my life. But, like, <laughs> it's one thing to be able to be disciplined, but it's a completely other thing to know what you're supposed to be disciplined in doing. Like, to have the instruction, right, of, like, correct yourself because it's almost worse to be disciplined in wickedness yeah which i have been <laughs> right <laughs> and it's like oh i know how to dedicate myself to somebody to, to something but from where do i get that correction you know it's such it's and it's such a blessing when it comes to be like oh like thank you god because now i don't have to be continuing down because what else would i know you know, without, without somebody like picking me up and be like, no, son, turn, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's and right. That's right. yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And it's again, like it, you can't, you can't intellectualize your way to it, man. No, no. And in these, you guys are and talking these days, pretty grounded. So I don't, <laughs> <laughs> actually pretty good so because <laughs> that's a happy problem on my part <laughs> it's perfect in his generations father <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sound like you had something dope to say father <laughs> but we're at two hours no, we're good. we are we are at two hours we are at two hours <laughs> <laughs> Who would win in a fight? Darth Vader, Batman. I know my answer. Oh. That's already been done, hasn't it? I don't care. I don't care what they have to say. I want your guys' opinions. I'm sure it has been done by some person who ran some simulation. Again, that's hot. That's mind versus heart. Like you can run now, now, now there's a question here. It's because always it's prep like time. Batman who, has prep time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is what I'm going with. Like how much advance notice of this encounter is happening? Is there an element of surprise? Or is it just like they meet each other on the street, they're going to fight? Because if Always. it's the latter, if it's Batman. the latter, then it's Darth Vader all day. Maybe, 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 maybe. There's precedent, the force. There's precedent to cite that, that Batman has definitely gone into uh, encounters with metahumans, aliens, or demigods with little to no notice and managed to beat them. Well, I'm going, I'm going Darth Vader. I'm going Darth Vader. That is incorrect. <laughs> correct. Father, what is your what is your uh, what is your vote on this one? You know, I don't I don't. Who would win in a fight, Superman or Darth Vader? Hold on. Oh, Superman. Sorry. Sorry. I don't I don't see a way which Darth Vader wins that. Really? Yeah. Let me tell Against you. Against Batman? Let me tell you why. Okay. Let me tell you why. Darth Vader See Batman's about the will. Mm -hmm. Darth Vader's about the will primarily, right? But the thing that the thing that Batman has that like Darth Vader lost is um and I, I could be wrong, someone but there's a There's a code. There's a there's a way of being that Darth Vader is like lost. Yes. Right? Yeah. And and I think I think that's the thing that always kind of keeps Batman like sort like I always pulls him through, you know. Because mm -hmm. I think I think that I think that's the big thing that you see about Anakin is that that loss of that code. Mm -hmm. That's his that's his undoing. And and I think someone could even go as far as to say. Darth Vader never really did anything. He was just a pawn of the Emperor, anyway. Mm -hmm. He was just an extension of, of the Emperor. And in fact, so much so that the death of Vader was really the recovering of Anakin, if that makes yes. sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense when I say that? Yep. The death of Vader is yep. the recovering of Anakin. Yep. So, so Vader's a shell. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Because Anakin's still in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, Vader. Yeah, you know, now that you mention it, if I think about the two of them, Batman is supremely disciplined. 
Like in terms of his control when he's in a, a conflict, his control over his, his self, himself. Vader is like the least, dis- I mean, he's doing force chokes on, well, on well, his Vader? own people and all of that. Well, what is Vader? Vader as a being is the loss of control of Anakin. Yeah, loss. He is, he is the manifestation of the loss of control. Yeah, that, he's completely out of Vader control. Is. Yeah, yeah. Batman is nobody's pawn. Batman is Batman's pawn. And my whole logic is is that would Superman beat Darth Vader? I say yes. I said yes. Well, Batman beat Superman. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I think King's Night to you, Ferdinand. (laughs) I think that within reason, prep time, Batman can beat pretty much anyone with prep time. Mm -hmm. And you know. Mm-hmm. Not just because I've been rewatching that clip from the Dark Knight Returns movie, like on like repeat, like the last couple of weeks, when he's like, "I want you to know the face of the one man who beat you," and it's just like, dude, that. Oh my gosh, this is the last thing I'll say because how cool is it in that scene? And it's been a long time because a certain person I know has my copy of Dark Knight Returns, which is fine, no big deal. And Watchmen, I really did the best I could to get him into, you know, whatever. How cool, because it's been a long time since I've sit and read that dialogue from Dark Knight mm-hmm. Returns. And I can't even remember if it's in the comic. But when Superman's like, you know, if it's not me, it's just going to be somebody else. When him and Batman are fighting and Batman's mm-hmm. like, really? Who do they send after you? Right, and it's right. like, oh my right. gosh. That's, that that's in the comic. So cool. yeah. That's in the comic. Yeah. It's yeah. been a yeah. long time since I read it, but I was Frank like, Miller yeah. at, his, at his height, man. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. So, yeah, I mean, I, I could just imagine Love all it. the scenarios. You've sold me. You've sold me. You've sold First me on this. Find like yes, one sold. type of wood that's like force resistant or something like that, then make like <laughs> a skeletal armor of it or something, and then like find a way to like decommission all of like Darth Vader's like electronic limbs, find a way to just <laughs> right. saber. Look. Batman in his utility belt has an EMP. An EMP. That would do it. That would be the end. <laughs> Done. Done. He can't breathe. At that point, he can't breathe. He's breathing through the... Yeah, that might be easier than we all think it might be. It just... Right. Like, yeah. I mean, don't take us the wrong way. Cyprian can beat Darth Vader. I mean... <laughs> oh, I guess that's true. I mean, we're not... We're not, you know, I don't, I don't think Vader's so great, you know? The part from... The part from New Frontier, even, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, but the part from New Frontier when he's talking to Martian Manhunter and he's like, um, he's like, I bought a a billion dollar green rock to take down the one in Metropolis. All I need is like a 97 cent package of... uh, of, of Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Oh, my gosh. That's so, so cool. (laughs) He's the dude, man. He's the Mm -hmm. dude. He's pretty awesome. He's the man. Uh, And then the last thing... I would be remiss if I didn't mention, I don't know if I've talked to you about this, Father, but this is good a place as any. Have I told you that that thing about C.S. Lewis, about Aslan is not an allegory to Christ? Yeah. If Narnia were real. Cyprian, have you heard this? No. Can you tell me? Uh, uh, yeah, that Aslan, if Aslan, or if Narnia were real, Aslan is Christ incarnate. He's not, he's not like an allegory. That's literally Christ. Christ would take the form of a lion in Narnia. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's so, pretty yeah. interesting. That's yeah, interesting. look into it. C.S. Lewis talks about it. It's pretty dope. Interesting. Yeah. Kind of adds a whole other layer to it. I so, got now now I gotta go back and uh, I gotta go back and read. My wife uh, is reading Wine, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe for the first time right now. And oh wow. Like, yeah. Well, I, she's like, daughter of Eve. She's like, what is this? And I was like, Mm-hmm. Just wait it gets so 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 good mm-hmm. so um okay so we have an email um mm-hmm. catch page is that what mm-hmm. it's called at royal uh, path. yeah landing page whatever landing yeah page. that's mm-hmm. realpath.network um mm-hmm. so there's that um feel free any questions or anything like that you can leave them in the comments for now we'll try and Maybe make a more concerted effort to scan those and see if there's anything that we mm-hmm. really address because I think that'd be legit. Mm-hmm. 
And I think me not having anything is my thing for the outro now. I just don't think I'll ever have anything. That will be the outro. You say, hey, sorry, I don't got anything. So <laughs> that's that. Well, oh, you got anything dope to drop before we take off? That's it. <laughs> All right. That's cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>